Genesis chapter 1, verses 4 through 13. Reading from the New International Version of 2011. Learning objectives for this session include the following. We shall know the timing of God's creative acts. We shall affirm the origin of light. And we shall be able to explain the sky vault. Remarks. To understand ancient literature and scripture, we must enter into the mind of the original readers. It does not suffice only to adopt official church doctrines, nor modern preachers' sermons and books, or even scientific hypotheses. We must not rely upon personal impressions, dreams, or experiences, especially not the arguments of 17th century European theologians. Ancient readers, in contrast with us modern readers, ancient readers held to a spiritualist worldview in which spirits were considered to be operative, whereas for modern readers, ours is a rationalist worldview in which only scientific laws or principles operate. For ancient readers, there were three kinds of living beings. The invisibles, who dwell in the high heavens. Mixed beings, who can, from time to time, appear visible. And, of course, visible beings, which include humans and beasts. For modern readers, there may be some invisible beings, such as God or angels, but there are no mixed beings, and we mainly believe in only the visible. There was much greater tolerance for theological mythology amongst ancient readers, whereas today we prefer scientific mythology, by which we pretend that science has determined for us reality. The ancients lived within collectivist societies, which included a lot more homogeneity of thought, whereas today we mostly dwell in individualist societies where we mostly think, live, and decide for ourselves. The ancients were motivated by shame or honor, whereas today we motivate or demotivate each other by appeal to guilt or innocence. Ancients submitted easily to traditional authority, whereas today we hold to limited and temporary authority. Ancient societies were mostly monocultural. Although they were aware of other societies and cultures, they believed their own to be right. Whereas today we are more tolerant of multiculturalism, believing that in each culture that which is believed to be right is all that matters. And theirs was a high context language, Writers and readers alike held so much common understanding that they did not have to use many words, whereas in today's societies with low context language, we must say more to create a common meaning. By way of review, in Genesis 1.1, we were introduced to the main thesis that Elohim created the sky and the earth. Elohim, meaning a living, intelligent, powerful spirit, plural in form with a singular verb. His action was bara, to fashion anew from old material. The phrase heavens and earth is a kind of trope or merism referring to the entire ordered universe and everything in it. By way of interpretation, we took this verse to be a thesis statement elaborated in the following verses. In Genesis 1-2, we were introduced to the initial conditions that prevailed as God commenced his creative activity. At that time, the earth was a chaos, tohu, meaning lack of order or shape, and it was empty, bohu, that is, neither inhabited nor inhabitable. And there was only darkness, referring to literal conditions, 
though symbolic of chaos, danger, evil, and rebellion. The Spirit of God we understand to be a great wind from God, as in Daniel 2.7 and in prevailing mythology. The lasting truth from this passage asserts that Elohim was in charge and not chaos monsters. In verses 3 through 5, we were introduced to the first creative day and the day and night cycle. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. Now, did the author mean 24-hour days, or long evolutionary ages, or was he only following tradition? In verse 3, Elohim commands light into existence. We deduce that Elohim is the first source of light, not the sun. Furthermore, ancients did not conceive of light as emanating from the sun or as reflected from the moon, nor do minor deities or nature gods generate light. Light would eventually become a symbol of God, of truth, and of all that is good. In verse 4, Elohim separates light and dark, which was good. From this we learn that Elohim regulates light and dark. No sacrifice is to be made to nature deities to ensure the rising sun. And light would eventually become a symbol of deity, of life, and of good, whereas dark will become a symbol of evil and of death. In verse 5, Elohim names and rules over day and night. From this verse, we learn that Elohim rules over both day and night. This truth is reflected in Psalm 91, verses 5 and 6. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. This verse stands as a prediction of Messiah's future ministry of exorcism. For the terms night, demon by day, pestilence and plague were names of demons in ancient societies. In verses 6 to 8, we are introduced to the second creative day, the expanse. And God said, Let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it. And it was so. God called the vault sky. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. This verse is interpreted by a modernist reconstructionist model of Hebrew cosmology invented in the early 20th century that no ancient Hebrew ever imagined, but has taught in universities to this day. A typical diagram proposes that there is some kind of a firmament up in the heavens holding an ocean of water with holes in it to allow rain to fall, and on which the sun and the moon move by ropes and pulleys activated by gods, all of this over a flat earth. So, was the vault a solid dome that does not exist? Five possibilities to understand this verse. First, the Bible is wrong, for there is no vault in the sky. Or perhaps the Bible is right, for there was a dome until it collapsed, causing the great flood. Others propose the Bible is useful, 
for it is speaking in terms that its original writer and readers understood. Or perhaps the Bible may be saying something else, for vault is a mistaken translation. But then, perhaps the Bible is mere fiction, for it is relating ancient myths that we know to be pre-scientific imagination. In verse 6, Elohim commands separation between waters. We understand the meaning to be this. There is no textual description of the vault other than that common to sky. That is, the asters, sun, moon, and stars, clouds, birds, and an occasional fiery chariot. Think of Elijah. The function, then, of this vault is merely separation. It is not a material structure. The function, then, was to divide upper and lower waters, the purpose of which was that Elohim would later collapse the waters, causing the great flood. This is a literary device. The term used for vault, rakia, and in the Greek Bible, stereoma, the Hebrew root means basically to spread out. It is used once of beating gold sheets. Otherwise, a cognitive noun for beaten metal occurs only in non-Hebrew languages. But in this context, the term simply means separation. Hence the translation expanse in the English Standard Version. Thus, the vault is a mere poetic parallel with the term sky or heavens. A more realistic Hebrew worldview sees four levels. At the top, the invisible heaven, the abode of the divine council. Then the visible sky, which reaches from ground level upwards, wherein birds fly, and the land and seas, where humans and beasts dwell. But then there is the underworld and Sheol, the abode of the dead. Thus we take verse 7 to refer to a vertical expanse between waters. And the phrase, to make a vault, to mean separate waters as a kind of creative act. The waters beneath, then, include sea, lakes, rivers, the deep, and wells. And the waters above to include rain and snow, the so-called windows of heaven. Genesis 7 relates, All the springs of the great deep burst forth, and the floodgates of the heavens were opened, and rain fell on the earth forty days and forty nights. Returning to the Greek term stereoma, a lexical definition reads, a state or condition of firm commitment, firmness, steadfastness. This noun in the Greek Bible occurs also in Colossians 2.5. I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm, stereoma, your faith in Christ is. Hence our thesis, the rakiach, refers to a separation between waters above and those below, serving in poetry as a synonym for heavens or sky. It is not a physical structure, vault, or dome, except in the imagination of skeptics and atheists. <clears throat> Thus, vault merely means sky. Compare other definitions in the same context. Light is day. Dark is night, land is earth, waters are sea, and the vault is the sky. We suggest then an Hebraist reconstructionist model of Hebrew cosmology deduced in the early 21st century that might approximate ancient Hebrew imagination, but is taught nowhere today. Creation, 
viewed vertically, consists of the heavens, called the sky and the expanse, and the earth. The heavens include the waters above, which give rain and precipitation, and the subterranean waters, whereas viewed horizontally, we have a separation between dry land and the seas. Anything more is a skeptic's attempt to discredit the Bible as foolish nonsense. Verses 9 to 13 introduce the third creative day, sea, land, and vegetation. And God said, Let the water under the sky be gathered to one place, and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land, and the gathered waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Now, when Elohim commands, who obeys? Seriously, we shall have more to say about this later. For now, we deduce that Elohim created, owns, and rules over both the land and the seas, not lesser gods or monsters. When God saw that it was good, we ask, good for what? In any event, what does this creation account mean for us this far? Well, for one, it was God who created the world good by design. That he created all animal and vegetable life. That God names and therefore owns all that he created. And it is he who sets limits and regulates time. There is more to come in our next session.